in the second half of Perak you give it to chapter 13 in Mishlei Pasuk Yudaled Torat Chacham Mekor Chaim Nasur Mimokshe Mavet The Torah of the wise he translates here is the fountain of life to depart from the traps of death The Torah of the Chacham is something that we should seek commentaries say that that is the advice that we should seek the advice of the Chacham because that advice could save us from all sorts of mokshim, from all sorts of traps in life. We're better off seeking the advice of a chacham when it comes to certain difficult situations in life, and not doing as many people do, is listen to what neighbors have to say, to what friends have to say. A lot of times we go by what people have to say. We're influenced but what their mind says and that may not be the best advice if we're in a difficult situation even though uh, we may be uncomfortable seeking the advice of the Chacham we may not like what he has to say but it's ultimately for our good because it will save us it will save us from all sorts of traps that we may not be aware of that they exist at at any given time we don't see the whole picture sometimes and we like to please people we're very close to our friends and to our neighbors, family members, and we'd like to take their advice in consideration, but sometimes that may not be the best advice. Torat Chacham Ekor Chaim, that is the fountain of life. A Chacham sees things in the eyes of the Torah, and therefore he may be able to see things we don't see. Chacham Ro'et Hanolad, as the rabbi tells in Birkavod, he's able to see the consequences long-term consequences of one's actions where people are not focused always on the long term they're focused on the short term so Shalom Mera tells us it's a good thing to seek out the advice of the Chacham especially when it comes to major issues in life the next pasuk Sechel Tov Yiten Chen V'derech Bogedi Metan good understanding gives grace but the way of the transgressors is hard Sechel Tov, dealing with people, acting with people, or speaking to people. Sechel Tov means with a good, positive mind, with tact, with a good attitude. All of that means Sechel Tov, with a healthy mind, with a knowledgeable mind. All of that has the ability to influence people. It makes an impression. If you know what you're talking about, you're confident, you have clarity, that's all called Sechel Tov. It has the ability to influence because as a result of the Sechel Tov Motzim Chen you find grace in people's eyes people like you and when people like you they respect you they will be willing to listen to what you have to say so Sechel Tov Yiten Chen it will it will allow one to find grace in the eyes of others however the Derech Bogedi Metam those transgressors will have a very difficult time changing. Etan is, means hard like a rock. Why will they have a hard time changing? In other words, no matter what you say to them will not make too much of a difference. He uses here the word bogedim for transgressors because they have betrayed. Gida, they have betrayed their mind. In other words, they will not accept logic. There are some people that have already made up their mind. And no matter what you say to them will not make any difference. If somebody has reached that point, it's almost a waste of time to talk to them. That's what he calls them bogedim, traitors. They have betrayed their own mind. In other words, even if you have the sechel tov, even if you have the chen, you may come up and you may come uh, come up with a situation where you're dealing with an individual who's very stiff-necked, very stubborn, and be, and very illogical because he's not willing to use his mind. Another idea here that the rabbis tell us is that one should always strive to find favor in the eyes of man and God. Whoever people like, people look up to, people have good words to say about him, also upstairs Bashamaim, they like him, they approve of him. That is the idea of Sechel Tov Yiten Chen, of finding grace. In other words, that should be something that we should pursue. Sometimes we, are, we pursue our own interests, but in the end, what should dictate, what we should pursue is something that will find favor in the eyes of, 
of man and Hashem. There is a special pasuk in the Torah that, that is directed towards that. There are some things that are not crystal clear, they're not black and white. If they are forbidden, they're not explicit in the Torah. And the Torah says, Vasita tova yashar b'nei Hashem. That even though it may not be outright forbidden in the Torah, you should do that which is right in the eyes of Hashem. In other words, ask yourself, you know, is this something right or not? And hopefully, one's mind, if it's a sechel tov, if it has clarity, he will be able to figure it out on his own. Rabbis tell us in the Gemara, even if we had no Torah, there will be certain things that we can figure out from the animals. We will be able to figure out modesty from the cats, right? They don't just uh, urinate anywhere. They don't want to be seen. We would learn from the doves. We would learn... What's that word in English? Loyalty. Loyalty. Right. We would learn certain things from the animals had we not had the Torah. The human mind is capable of observing and figuring out things on his own if he were to be fair with himself, if he would have a sechel tov. And in this way, of course, if he will strive to find favor in the eyes of man, he will find favor in the eyes of Hashem. The next pasuk, kol arum bedaat ifros ivelet. In everything a prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool lays bare his folly. That's the fancy translation here. Uh, in simpler words, kol arum bedaat, an intelligent man or a prudent man thinks before he talks, he thinks out things, he wants to be sure that what he's doing is the right thing. He only says something if he's fully confident. Yasebedat, he doesn't take a chance. He wants to be as much as possible certain that this is the right thing to do, that this is correct. He has to be completely in control. He doesn't want to regret it. So Arum Yasebedat, he thinks about things before he acts upon them. Whereas a kesile fool, ifrosi veret, he basically scatters, or how does he say it over here? He lays bare his folly. In other words, he exposes himself very easily because he doesn't think things out thoroughly or carefully. Therefore, he acts prematurely. The right thing to do, therefore, is to think, to think things out properly, not to be overconfident to consult, to seek the advice of someone. All of these Pesukim are somewhat related. He's telling us to to seek the advice of those who are more knowledgeable, to think things out so that we're more certain about our actions before we do them. The next Pasuk, Malach Rasha Yipol Vera Betzir Emonim Marpe. A bad messenger falls into mischief, but a faithful envoy brings healing. It's interesting that in this Pasuk, two words are used for messenger. One is a Malach. Malach, other than being an angel, is another word for a messenger. And so is the word tzir. The importance of using messengers. Messenger can make a big difference. You know, for whatever reason, if you have a messenger, you want to have a good messenger. Because a good messenger can make a bad situation look good. A bad messenger can make a good situation look bad. In other words, if we're handing something over to a messenger... He could ruin it, or he can improve it. What's an example of a messenger? I thought of one messenger that is a very important messenger of ours. That is the teachers of our children. We entrust in them, our kids. Hopefully, they are good messengers. They can take that which is not so good and improve upon it. If it's a bad messenger, then they may be taking something which is good and making it bad. So that's what he says of him. Ultimately, the bad messenger will will take something which may be otherwise good, but it will turn out bad. The tzir emunim, a messenger who is faithful, marpe brings healing. Means that healing, he can take something which is not so good, does not look so good, and heal it or improve upon it. This situation can apply in other areas too. Messengers. Who do you trust with your money? Who do you trust with your kids? Who do you trust with your babysitter? You know, ba- in other words, what kind of a babysitter do you choose? And we've heard all sorts of stories in the news of babysitters doing all sorts of things. And, but we're blind. We sometimes do not know. 
So this is an important idea, Malach Rasha, a, or, or Sirimunim, the type of messenger that we appoint, that we have, can make a big difference in whatever the mission is that we are entrusting him with. Next pasuk, Resh vekalon porea musar veshomer tochachat yichubad. Poverty and shame come to him who refuses instruction, but he who heeds reproof shall be honored. Resh vekalon porea musar. Simple, simply, loosely translated, it means one who does away with musar, with rebuke. In the end, he will have resh vekalon. Resh means poverty, kalon means shame. Poverty is not only in money, poverty is also in the mind. One who does not listen to the rebuke, he's losing out a great deal. The hacham, or whoever the individual is giving him musar, may be teaching him a very important lesson. But those who are unwilling to listen, porea musar, who just do away with it, they will ultimately come unto poverty and shame. Poverty of the mind and, and shame, ultimately disgrace because of not doing the right thing. That is one interpretation over here. Whereas Veshomer Tochachat Yechubad, one who listens to the Musa, to the rebuke, in the end will come out ahead. He will be honored. You were going to say something? Maybe Yes, either shame or disgrace. Right. Right. Another interpretation of this pasuk that it's, we're talking about the one who actually gives the musar. Resh vekalon porea musar. One who does not do a good job in giving rebuke. Why doesn't he do a good job? Because he does it with poverty of the mind. He's not knowledgeable. Or he does it with kalon, by putting someone to shame, by acting forcefully. He will not succeed in his musar. This could be a father with a child. This could be a teacher with a student. If it's not done properly, if it's done with resh, with poverty, poverty of the mind, he's not trained, he's not knowledgeable, or he does it in a forceful manner that brings shame, that is not the way to get through. That is not the way to give musar. Another idea of the second half of the pasuk, Shomer Tochachat Yechubad, at first it may be very shameful. It may be very painful and difficult for somebody to be receiving the Musar. But in the end, if he accepts it, Yehubat, he comes out ahead, he comes out respectful. It's difficult, it's painful for one to hear any criticism. But in the end, this is for our benefit. Yehubat, honor will come out of it. The next pasuk, Ta'ava nihiya te'arav lenafesh v'to'avat kesilim sur mera. Those of you who are on a diet are going to like this pasuk. Here, he, let me see how he translates it. Desire fulfilled is sweet to, the, sweet to the soul, but it's an abomination to fools to depart from evil. He's talking about ta'avot here, talking about the desires, different kinds of desires. And one interpretation of the word ta'avaniya, te'erav, is a broken desire. One who controls his appetite, one who goes on a diet one who restricts himself. Restricting oneself or, or controlling one's desires, te'erav, lenafesh, this is good and it's sweet to the soul. Not to the body, but to the soul. Controlling one's desires is something good. Breaking one's desires, it's sweet. To'avat kesirim sulmera, those who are fools have a hard time with this. They feel they're missing out on something. They'd like to taste everything there is. So to them, to'ava, it's an abomination, in other words, it's disgusting, it's difficult, it's painful to hold himself back, mira, from that which is unhealthy, that which is no good. So that's one idea over here, Shlomo Melech is talking about how healthy and how good it is to be able to control one's desires. Another interpretation is, ta'ava niya te'erav nafesh, that even though at first when we try to control ourselves, our ta'avot, we have a hard time, it's very difficult to go on a diet. You just have to eat some salads, and you can't eat your favorite uh, foods. So at first, it's difficult. But at the end, ta'avaniya, if you were able to control yourself, at the end, te'erav nafesh, when you're able to see, you lost 55 pounds. It feels good at the end. After you've, in other words, at first, losing the weight, controlling your desires is difficult. 
You can't have your chocolate cake. You can't have those favorite brownies, right? Or whatever it may be, and it's difficult. It, it really is for everybody, especially, especially those who have a sweet tooth, all the chocolates, right, and all the, the good stuff. But in the end, Teirav Lenafish, in the end it is sweet. Not only is it an accomplishment, you realize that you really didn't have to have it. It's just it's hard in the very beginning, that's all. Another idea here is that Ta'avani Ya Teirav Lenafish, that at first when it arrives, when the Ta'ava arrives, it is very sweet. It is very powerful. Te'rav le'nafesh. And that is why Ta'avat Kisidim Su it is very difficult for the fools to, to let go of it. Some of the desires can be very powerful. However, what happens most of the time after you've gotten what you want? Something which is not so good. You feel bad you've had it. Let's say you're trying to go on a diet and you just were invited to some uh, Smogger's board, right? We, or to a Viennese table. If anybody, do you, you all know what a Viennese table is? After everybody has had a sumptuous meal with rib steak, with a uh, five, uh, five uh, course meal, some weddings they serve a Viennese table with all the delicacies and all the foods and cakes. How much could you eat? But the eye you know, the eye is not satisfied, never satisfied, and it sees all these colorful cakes with cream and chocolate and 12-layer cake, not a 7-layer, 12 if they make it, I don't know. <laughs> and how could you resist that? But what happens after you've eaten it and you've promised you'd go on a diet? What happens? Don't you feel bad? You say, did I really have to have it? Mit khartim. There's something called kharata. You regret it. You only regret it after the fact. So he says, Ta'avaniya te'rav le'nafesh. At first, a person, of course, is overcome by this ta'avot, but in the end, he will regret it. Ta'avat kesilim sumera. The kesil, the fool, the one who's after all this food, never feels bad. On the contrary, there are some people that after they've had all this food to eat, they go to the restroom, they vomit, so they can go back to eat. Have you heard of this before? They go, they vomit what they've eaten, so they can go back and eat again. Huh? Bulimia. Bulimia? Yeah. Intentionally? That's in, no, bulimia, I don't know if it's, I think that's unintentionally. You just, they throw up a lot, no? No, no, no. They, they, do, that they do that themselves? Yes. The Romans culturally used to do this. It was called, the, in translation, the vomitorium. They would induce vomit, they said they can go back and feast. Really? <coughs> so it was something already back then? Yes. Yeah. In ancient, in ancient Rome. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, what, what what's very interesting about all these tavot, for the most part, is that all these tavot, one can tell, they're not tachlitiot. They have no, they serve no real purpose. Why? Because after you filled up your stomach, you have no more craving. Isn't that right? It stops. Most tavot in the world, after you've had so much of it, that's it. You even get sick and tired of having tuna fish for a whole week, right? After a while, you're tired of it. You get sick. What does that show you if after you filled yourself, you don't want any more? That it doesn't really serve any purpose to pursue it. This is not so important. You need to eat because you need to survive. But it's not a tachlit. It's not something that you have to pursue. Because after you've gotten it, you don't want it anymore. If that's the case, then we have a big question. There is one tava that for some reason, no matter how much you will have, you want more. Which one is that? Money. No, no, I'm talking about this. Uh, well, that, that's a spiritual. Money. Money. By the way, do you know where the word kesef comes from? The word kesef comes from kisufim, lichsof, to desire. Nichsaf. Nichsaf, nichsaf. Right? People want it for some reason, more and more. Why is it that the people want money? Why aren't people just tired of having the money? They want more. Anybody want to suggest anything? Why is the desire of money uh, insatiable? Is that how you pronounce it? Insatiable. You sure? Because there's yeah. no limit to what you can buy. Huh? There's no limit to what you can because buy. Because of Kina. Because of Kina. People are never happy. They want to have a yacht. They want to have a plane. Right, the personal, they want to have a house in Palm Springs and in Malibu, and they're still not happy. But yes, but what's the, pro what's the reason? Existence, you know, 
Existence? Kiyum? Kiyum, yes, existence. Yeah, but, but let's say you have a million dollars. You know, remember where I told you to ask Paul Getty, John Paul Getty, you know, how much is enough? He said just a little more. <laughs> you know, so, you know. What's going on? So this is the way I, it, yes. This is the way I explain it. There may be several ideas here, several explanations. Million dollar beggars, yeah. Rabbis tell us, "En adam met vechatzita avato beyado." A person does not die having achieved even half of his desires. In other words, no matter how long you live, you will not be able to even get half of what you want. You will always, because whoever has mishesh lo manero tzematayim, because whoever has a hundred wants two hundred. So a person does not die having reached not even half of his desires. So I, this is the way I explain. What does it mean, half of his desires? Obviously, they were talking about money for the most part. When it comes to money, there's two desires involved in money. It's a two-part game, two-part desire. One is making it, and the second half is spending it. Keeping it? Make, yeah, well, obviously, spending it. Keeping it. Well. Money, it's not keeping it. Yeah, but well, using it. So people have the two, there's two, it's a two-part desire, wanting to earn it, wanting to have it in your hand, wanting to possess it, and then wanting to spend it and enjoy it. So the rabbi is meant, the person does not ever get to the point of spending all the money that, he, that he's made. In other words, he's barely making the first desire, the first half of his desires, which is what? Trying to make the money. He does not ever enjoy spending all that money. So in other words, the, the, this desire of money is never ending. Because there's several parts to it. There's a, first I'm going to make it, then I'm going to buy, it, then I'm going to do this. The plans go on and on and on on how to use this money and what to do with the money. And it becomes a golden calf that people worship and they don't let go of it. Yes? So is that saying that um, no, no, we're going to get to that soon. There are people who are very happy with their lot because they've trained themselves with a very important concept in Judaism that whatever you're supposed to have is already dictated either from Rosh Hashanah or from one's Mazal and one should be just happy with what Hashem has given him and not want more than that because that is what he needs to have there are some people who are meant to have more some people who are meant to have less but that is what is meant for them specifically for them for whatever reason and if one recognizes this that he's strengthening the midah of bitachon. Not, in other words, a lot of Jews believe in God, but they don't necessarily have that bitachon, that reliance, the full confidence that he provides for them exactly according to their needs. Those, there are some individuals who have actually observed how with every child that is born, their salary increases, their mazal changes. For the, for the, Hashem accommodates the additional child somehow. But those who have no bitachon, so that every child I have to feed is more money, I don't have that. But you will have that. So it's a lack of bitachon. So a person, a person who is happy with his lot, he's a person that shows that he's, he has bitachon bashem. And uh, it's, it's something which not too many people have, unfortunately. Because what we just said, people want more and more and more. They think maybe this will give them more security. They think this will make them happier. They have the wrong ideas. I just, I just made one suggestion of why this is a never-ending desire. But in reality, with money, it's a combination of things. It's psychological too. It's not just a bodily need. It's in the mind. We, I gave examples of bodily needs that you're satiated after a while. But with the money, it's not a bodily need. It goes on. Psychological, security, I need this. Who says you need this? Many people get something and after a while they don't, they don't really use it. I've read many articles in newspaper of people rushing to buy the latest computer and it's sitting in the garage in the box unopened. They had a habit. They had a habit. They had, yeah, sure, because it's the latest thing. The latest gadget. And all these credit cards that people have, you know, is what is making the system run. That people have to get everything that's out there and somehow will pay for it later. Yeah, so anyway, so Shalom Amalek speaks about the, the, the importance of controlling oneself 
and how those who cannot control themselves are kisilim. Not because they cannot, because they don't want to. That's the difference. Everybody can. Kisilim don't want to. Yes. What about people who have addictions, Rabbi? What happens to those people? They tie up alcohol, drugs, what about those people? Yeah, an, an addiction is something very, very difficult, but the Torah is able to cure even addictions. There are ways for people to uh, let go of their addictions. They have to go through certain uh, classes, right, where they uh, make them drop their addictions. So there are ways that one can do it. It's hard, but it's possible. One has to want to. And that's really the bottom line with almost anything. You have to want to. If you have an interest in doing something, you you shouldn't have a problem, you know, doing it. It all depends what it is. But in controlling oneself, controlling one's desires, it's obviously possible. All right. The next pasuk, Olechet Chachamim Yachkam Veroechesilim Yeroa. He who walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. Here, Shlomo Melech is talking about the importance of companionship who are your friends, and the importance of having teachers or rabbis as friends, or at least being around them, spending time with them, consulting with them. Why? Because one will become, or will be influenced by those who he associates with. So, lech et chachamim yachkam, one who goes with chachamim, will become a chacham, or will be influenced by them. Commentaries explain the reason why it says Olech. The commentaries explain the reason why it says Olech is the, the, the one way to learn from someone is to be to think of yourself as tafelahim, that you are secondary to him. In other words, you humble yourself to them. You're willing to learn from them. If one always thinks of himself as more intelligent, more important, better than somebody else, then he will not learn from them. So Olech, the commentaries explain umitbatel umuhan liot tafel. He's willing to not consider himself. Imagine somebody who is a, a nuclear scientist with a PhD in very prominent position um, in the Pentagon going to a shiur from some 25-year-old Avrech in the Kolen, young man who just came from the yeshiva. I mean, it's pretty humbling, but he wants to learn Torah. He wants to listen to the words of the Torah, to what he has to say. That's what it takes to learn. That is what it takes to absorb. What the Chacham has to offer is to be willing to be tafel, to humble oneself before the individual. In the Midrash, there's a beautiful example of how we're influenced by our surroundings. There was an individual who went to a perfume store, went in and did not buy anything. He walked out and he was smelling of perfume. If you want to try this out, go to Gucci on Rodeo Drive. You walk in, as soon as you step, it comes down on you. I heard this is what I'm told, I never went in there. It just comes down, there's something that spritzes on top of you, so that you smell. In the example of the Midrash, it's like coming down at you, just because you went in and because there's so much perfume in that store, niklat, it sticks to you, and you come out smelling good. The Midrash continues on. However, imagine somebody going into a bursiki. Bursiki is a tannery. A tannery is where they they process hides, right? Smelly hides of animal skins. And so this man goes in, did not buy anything, comes out smelling. So that's what the Midrash says. That's what we mean over here. You will definitely get something from the Chachamim if you stick around them. But those who stick around the fools will suffer harm. It will stick to them. Alright, the next pasuk. Evil pursues sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. Simple meaning is that one who has been doing ra, one who has been doing evil, committing sins, teradef ra'a. Because Hukvar Murgal, he's already used to it, he just c- continues to pursue it. He doesn't let go of it. It's difficult for him to let go. As the rabbis tell us, Avera goreret Avera, one sin leads to another. So Chataim, Teradef Ra'ah, they're always pursuing this, they're always going after this. 
it is very difficult for them to let go. With Tzadikim Yishalem Tov, how will they be rewarded? That the Maaseh Tov Yalitz Alehim, it will speak up for them. One idea behind this is that the sins are accusations. When one has many sins on his record, they act as accusing, accusations, accusing angels, go after him, pursue him. But Tzadikim Yishalem Tov, where somebody who has done many acts of good and kindness, at the time of need, they will, be, they will speak up for him. I, I'm not sure if I explained it last week or in the Drasha of Shabbat or at some point, that many, many tears uh, have been shed, many prayers have been said by us, by our forefathers, and they may have gone unanswered for some reason that only Hashem knows, but they're not wasted. Hashem has a treasure house where He keeps all the tears and all the prayers, and in time of need, when one of our descendants may need that, Hashem says, well, his grandfather cried so much, prayed so much, did so much, all those zechuyot yalitsu tov, they will speak up even for the descendants. So nothing is wasted. So whereas with the chataim, the accusations pursue them and don't let go of them, the tzaddikim, their ma'asim, speak up for them. Rabbis therefore tell us in the Gemara, if somebody commits a sin, let's say he just was overcome by his yetzerara, umiyad mitharet, and he immediately regrets it on the spot, enozaz mishamat shemokhalim lo. At that moment they forgive him. What does that mean? It doesn't mean they atone. It doesn't say mechaprim lo. It says mochalim lo. Rosh Hashanah is coming, and you will be reading the the idea is called slicha mechila kapara, various levels of forgiveness. Kapara is the ultimate, where Hashem atones and removes the stain. There's no no vestige of it, nothing left of it. The slicha or mechila, depending, there's two opinions on what each one is. They are temporary. Hashem postpones, pushes it off, does not count it. There is even one form of mechila where Hashem says, first time I let go, second time I forgive, three strikes and you're out. What does that mean? Just like the California law. If I, if I remember correctly, if you do it three times, then they count the first and second time too. Is that the way it works? Hashem does not sometimes count the first and second, but if you do it three times, then He brings back the first and second, which He was more hell which he was putting aside, didn't do anything about it. So what's important is to break that pattern by showing remorsefulness. What the Harata accomplishes, therefore, according to that Gemara I just mentioned, is Mechila. The accusing angel has no more power to latch on to this man because he showed regret. He was remorseful. If a person is not remorseful, then the accusation continues to pursue him day after day. Yes. Uh huh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, is there certain sins um, that are specifically? Um, yeah, obviously. Yeah, obviously. There, in the Rambam, there he enumerates the difference between not having fulfilled the mitzvah ase, a positive command. For example, a person did not put on tefillin one day, so he did not fulfill an ase, or he did a love. And it was something that you're not supposed to do, for example, not eating kosher. He ate something non-kosher. Or, Halila, if he did something worse, he committed a sin which there is karet for. For example, a man who was with his wife and she did not go to the mikveh. That is a very difficult sin. So, it, it, obviously, there's differences in how to handle each one of them and how they're handled upstairs. Yes? What's the meaning of karet? Karet means to be cut off, and there's various forms of cut off. The simple form of cut off is that the, his, that the years are decreased. Okay. He was meant, he was going to live to 82, and now he's going to be 62. Oh, okay. Thank you. Or something like that, you know. I don't, we don't know how many years are removed, depending on when he did it, how he did it, what the circumstances were. That is the one form of karet. Rabbis tell us because an addiction is something very powerful. <laughs> One who does an Avera and repeats it, it becomes to him permissible. In other words, it, it just becomes easier for him to do it the second time around. And that is why it's difficult to, to let go of it, because the second time around, the third time around, it's, he doesn't take it as seriously as the first time when he was hesitating whether to do something or not. 
Another idea behind the words that Sadiqim Yishalem Tov, we said that with the sinners, Chataim Teradef Ra'a, they pursue more and more opportunities to do evil because they're so stuck in the doing of evil. But Sadiqim Yishalem Tov, because they have proven, they have a proven record that they do good things, Hashem says, you know what? I'm going to give you the opportunities to do more. If one enjoys doing tzedakah, giving charity, so the rabbis tell us Hashem will make sure that that the poor who come to Him will be poor who really need the money, not just anybody, not people who will take your money and spend it on booze, right? People who really need the money, anim hagunim. Plus, Hakadosh Baruch will send you opportunities to fulfill the mitzvah. One has demonstrated that this is what he wants to do. That Hashem says, "Okay, I'm going to send it your way." Next pasuk tov yanchil b'nei vanim v'tzafun latzadik chel chote. A good man leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren, but the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Very interesting pasuk here. He, this some of it we've seen before that those who are good, those who are tzaddikim, they will leave behind their merits and their money to their children and grandchildren. That money which has a beracha will last, will continue on to future generations like the family that I told you about, the Rothschild family, where the, the old man received a blessing and the money stayed in the family, that is a beracha. Not only does the beracha of the money continue on, not only does it last for, very, for many generations, the zechut of the, of the grandfather who was good, those merits are transferred over and can be used by the children. So that's tov yanchil b'nei The good has the ability to inherit, to give over a great deal to the children. However, the tzafun la tzadik chel chote. The sinner does not give over anything because if what he has has no blessing, it will not last. But something else happens here. And that's a very interesting idea that he expresses here that is more elaborated in, uh, in the rabbi's words. Chel tzafun la tzadik chel chote. The wealth of the sinner is given to the just. There are situations where if a man, an individual, for example, speaks Lashon Ara, gives another individual a bad reputation, then his mitzvot will go over to the individual that he spoke about. There are certain sins that will cause the man who commits the sins to lose his mitzvot and go over to the credit of, of, the, of the another individual, of the tzaddik. So when the tzaddik comes upstairs and he sees this, uh, this great amount of credit on his, in his account, where did it come from? It came from this man who insulted you or did something to you, and you of course kept your mouth shut. That's important, obviously. And as a result of that, you were able to receive his merits. That man who lost his merits comes upstairs and says, where is all that? You lost it. So, tzafun la tzaddik hel chote. All the wealth of the sinner will go to the just, to the one who is a tzaddik. But there is another very interesting idea over here, and that is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in his ways, sometimes brings about that the money of the wicked, the actual money of the wicked, will go to the tzaddikim. The most famous story that many of you perhaps have heard as children is your, the story of Yosef Mokir Shabbat. Yosef, very wonderful Jew, had one beautiful mitzvah. He did many mitzvot, but one that was very much his mitzvah more than anybody else, and that he gave a lot of honor to the Shabbat. He spent all the money he can to beautify and respect the Shabbat, even though he was a poor man, very, very poor. They barely ate anything an entire week. But when it came to, when it came Friday, he took all his savings that he had, and he made a beautiful Shabbat, which the whole family enjoyed. There was a neighbor, a rasha, an evil man, a stingy man, who lived not too far away in a big palace. One night he has a dream, a bad dream. Wakes up, goes to his advisors, I had a terrible dream. What did I see in my dream? That that Jew is going to take all my money away. So can you advise me what to do about it? So uh, they said, you know what? Sell all your gold and silver and your furnishings and your house and everything and buy yourself a jewel 
and sew it into your hat. In this way, he won't be able to get his hands on it. And that's what he did. He got the most expensive jewel, sewed it into his hat, held on to his hat all the time, and left, because he sold everything. So he left to be as far away as possible from this Yosef. He's never going to get my money. As he was going over a bridge, a wind came and blew off his hat into the water. And he, of course, you can imagine him, he ran after the, the, the hat, but it sank. And after a couple of days, of course, the, the strings and the hat, of course, all that was, everything that was sewn in the hat fell apart, and the jewel also slipped out of the hat. And guess what happened after that? A big fish came and swallowed the, the jewel. One Friday, the fishermen were catching fish. All of a sudden, they pulled up a big fish. This one was bigger than usual. And they said, great, we're going to make a good, good living from selling this fish, a good profit. But nobody wanted to buy it. It was too expensive. So they said, you know what, let's take this fish to Yosef Mokir Shabbat. He always buys, he doesn't care about how much he spends. Maybe he will buy the fish. It turns out that Yosef Mokir Shabbat had already prepared gefilte fish or whatever for Shabbat. But as soon as he saw this big fish, he says, yeah, sell it to me. Here's the money, no matter what it costs. And he went out, he got ready to prepare this fish for Shabbat. As soon as he cut it up, of course, he found the jewel, became a rich man. It's a famous story, it's a true story, and there are many variations of this story, you know, other stories in Divrei Hazal, that show and demonstrate this point, that the wealth of the, of the wicked will go to the, to the tzaddikim. It's a funa tzaddik hel chote. What was his reward over here? Why was he getting this reward? Because he was so careful with the kavod of Shabbat. He did everything for, for the honor of Shabbat. And Hashem rewarded all the money that he spent. All the money that he spent, and he spent a lot of money to honor the Shabbat, he got it back. And that is what the rabbis tell us, that that which we are supposed to receive on Rosh Hashanah for an entire year does not include our expenses for Shabbatot and Hagim. One should show more kavod and spend more money and beautify and honor the Shabbat by having better food, more food, and not to skimp. Because all that, you're going to get it back anyway, just like Yosef Mokir Shabbat did. Next pasuk, Rav Ochel Nir Rashim V'yesh Nispeh Bilo Mishpat. This is a very difficult pasuk, and you'll see why in a moment. The translation means like this. Much food is in the well-tilled acre of the poor. All right, I'll use my translation instead. But sometimes ruin comes for lack of judgment. The way he's translating it over here is that there's a lot of food sometimes by the tilling of the poor. The poor men till the ground, they cultivate the ground, they sow the fields, and that produces a lot of food. Okay? But sometimes ruin comes from lack of judgment. That's his translation. There's various translations, various interpretations over here. The simple translation means like this. The poor till the ground. They do all the hard work. Who gets to eat all the food? Who buys it? The rich. So yesh rav ochel nir rashim, the abundance of food that is produced by the poor, even though they worked so hard, somehow they don't get the benefit from all that. It's the rich. In the same way that that happens, yesh nispe below mishpat, there are some who live this world without a mishpat, not in their, not before their time. What's the connection over here? Did you understand what I just said? Yesh nispeh below mishpat. There are some that leave this world without a mishpat. There was no judgment. In other words, in the same way, the poor do all this work and the rich benefit. There's a, apparently a lack of justice here. In the same way, it could happen that a man did not do anything wrong and he dies. This is a very famous pasuk the second half, Yesh Nispeh Velo Mishpat, Zohar uses it to explain why some people die before their time, even though it was not meant for them to die. And there are several explanations. Explanation number one, Malach Avam Mavit, the angel of death, made a mistake. He made a mistake. Yes, the Gemara talks about that, how he was supposed to go after one Miriam, and he made a mistake and took another Miriam. I won't get into that, how that happens, but it can happen. Now, even though it could happen, 
ultimately everything makes sense but nevertheless it's a possibility that's not the most common forms of people leaving this world without judgment there are other individuals who leave this world without judgment because they are living at a time or in a place where there is a magifa they just happen to be in New Orleans at the wrong place at the wrong time and they did not have any, not enough merits to save them they were meant to live for many more years but there was a there was a disaster there was a Puranut, a Gezerah and they went without a Mishpat another form of Yesh Nispeh Bilo Mishpat is when HaKadosh Baruch sees a teenager who will get worse he takes him before the age of 20 usually Mita Bidei Shamaim Onish Bidei Shamaim is after the age of 20 Bidei Adam is after the age of 13 you're an adult between 13 and 20 nothing is supposed to happen in other words Bidei Shamaim so if somebody dies at the age of 16, 17, what could it be? One of the possibilities, there are various, one of the possibilities is that Hashem says, let me take him now while he's still a tzaddik. Because the way things are going now, he will deteriorate. Let me take him now while he's still a saint, instead of later on when he's a rasha. This week's parasha has a similar concept with Ben Sorer More, with a rebellious child that is put to death, because the Torah says, basically, let's do it now, well, it's still innocent, somewhat innocent, somewhat. Before he becomes a worse rasha, before he becomes a murderer and a thief, large scale. So sometimes, yesh nispeh below mishpat, Hashem takes, some, takes on an, an individual before his time for some good reason. In other words, it may not be a real judgment. It may not be because he deserves it, because he did something to deserve that. It could be because he was at war. He went to battle, as a young man at the age of 21, he was supposed to live to 86, 87. But at war, we are exposed to dangers. And if we don't have enough merits, or some other calamity, if you're there and you don't have enough merits to protect you, Hashem will not protect. The person will just go. So let me just finish. So this is an important concept. Yesh nispeh v'lo mishpat, even though we don't understand it. In the end, there is a cheshbon. The Hashem system works like that, even though it, it could have been different. Another interpretation of this pasuk of Yeshni Spevilom Mishpat, that even though there are some who till their fields and they have an abundance of crop, there are some who fail. Even though they've worked hard. Why does that, why does that happen? That there are some who work and produce, and there are some that Nispevilom Mishpat, they die of hunger. In other words, they, they don't succeed. That's all Midarche Hashemit Barat, that's all uh, a mystery and why Hashem does certain things like that, even though we see some people doing well. The same thing, the exact same career, the exact same thing being done by someone else, not working out. That's one of the mysteries of, Hashem, of, of, of the world, that we don't always understand. But that's another interpretation of this pasuk, of Rav Ochel Nir Rashim, many succeed or many produce an abundance of food, and there are those that somehow did not succeed in doing the same thing. Nispeh meaning either they die of hunger or they didn't do something correctly below Mishpat and as a result of that they failed. And why? Midarche Hashem Midbarach. That is one of the mysteries that we don't understand. Yes? No. No, below Mishpat means without a judgment without necessarily uh, a judgment is punishment? yes a punishment or I, I prefer to call it mishpat not necessarily a punishment in other words that Hashem made that decision that that's the way it needed to be earlier on he was just caught in this trap ok let's finish up over here some very important pesukim the translation of this he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him early. Famous pasuk. Holding back your rod. Hitting a child. Famous argument. Should you do it or not do it? Shlomo tells us it's important to do it sometimes. You can't abuse it. You have to be careful. You can't do it out of anger. You have to do it for the right reasons. You can't use a big rod. You have to use something soft. There are many rules on how to hit a child. Hitting a child in Judaism is accepted form of Musar. It's an accepted form of, of educating and training while he's young and not during the time he's a teenage. 
because once a child is a teenage, we are tempting him to hit back, chas v'shalom, and that will put him in a very, very a bad situation where he's committing a very grave sin against his parent. So you, don't, you want to be very careful with a teenage son, what you do. But with children, that's sometimes the only way they will learn, to stay away from things that are harmful. And if you don't do it, if you hold back your rod, in the end you end up hating your child because you yotzel le tarbut ra'a. He will do things terrible and you will ask yourself, what happened? Well, what happened? You pampered him, you spoiled him, you held back the rod. So the simple translation here is Shlomo Melech is warning us, if you don't educate discipline in a strict way, when necessary, only when necessary, not every day, then in the end, so he who really loves his child, Shiharom Musar. Shiharom Musar means that he disciplines him early. It means two things to discipline early. Early means in the morning, it means daily, regularly. Shiharom Musar, every day you tell him some Musar. You point out things to him on a daily, you don't save it for on Shabbat, on the Shabbat table. Every time you see something, Shiharom Musar, early on, in the morning, first thing, you mention it to him. That is one idea of Shiharom Musar. Shiharom means also early in a different sense. Don't wait till the problem arises. Tell him beforehand. Don't wait till he gets into trouble. This is not right. This is no good. Give Musar to a child early on. Have a class with him. Learn with him Musar. Tell him what to stay away from. Don't wait till he gets uh, involved with a bad friend. This is not good for you. Tell him before what friends are. That there's some good and there's some bad. Shiharo Musar, therefore, don't wait for trouble to arise. Early on, give him the Musar, train him, rebuke him, show him, share with him what you know. And in this way, hopefully, something will be there. Something will stick. Something will stick in, 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 when he becomes an adult. Rabbis tell us when giving discipline, we have to remember a tremendous important cloud. One of the most important rules in discipline and in relations between husband and wife is always use your left hand to push aside and always use the right hand to embrace that has two interpretations when you use when you have to push aside someone that means you have to rebuke use your left hand your softer hand your weaker hand don't use your right hand and for sure don't use both hands small doha when you have to use it use your left Use your right hand to embrace. The rabbis also meant with that another thing. If you hit a child, you slapped him, you rebuked him, you did it with your left hand, make sure that a couple, moment, a couple minutes later you also embrace him with the right. Let him see both. Let him see the criticism, let him see the left hand, but let him see the right hand too. Don't just always use your left, don't always just criticize. Husband spoke not nicely to his wife because he was in a bad mood or because he really felt that he needed to criticize something that she, will, she did not do right. Fine, these things happen. Just make sure you make up for it later on. You embrace. And this time, of course, use both hands if you can. And in everyone in his own way should do whatever he can to appease, to make the other person feel secure and good that you still care for them, you still love them. You didn't mean anything. Uh, badly. So if you, you, if you had to use your left hand, and it happens that you sometimes have to rebuke and give Musa, just make sure that you embrace, that you use your right hand too. You can't just do one. Just like you can't just show love and affection because you're holding back a rod. In the same way you can't just use your left hand to rebuke. You've used your left and use your right. Tzadik ochel sova nafsho v'veten reshaim tehsar The righteous eats to satisfy his soul, but the belly of the wicked suffers want. Famous pasuk, a tzaddik is content with what he has, with the food. He doesn't live to eat, he eats to live. That's basically what this pasuk is saying. The bet and the, the stomach of the rasha is always want. In other words, he always wants more and more and more. A tzaddik eats just to survive. Food is not a goal in itself. It's just a means to survive. But as I said before, some people just live to eat. They want more and more and more. That's not a good thing, it's not healthy. It, it allows the, the, the desires to control one, the, all this food to take over. You have to have some control and some discipline. Another idea over here is that those who are truly tzaddikim, uh, 
they do things properly, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends the Berachah in their food, that they can eat a little bit, and they're happy, and they're satisfied. Imagine just eating one slice of bread, and you don't have to eat for the rest of the day. That would be a tremendous Berachah. And if Am Yisrael would, ha- would have this Berachah, then the little that we have in Israel would be in more than enough. Berachah is not only abundance, Berachah also means that the little you have is, satisfies you. Sure. That's good enough. Who needs to eat more? And that is what uh, some of the Nuschaot in Birkat Amazon say, the Sephardic one, that the Yiratzon that we ask for and pray for, Shema Shachanu Yele Sov'ah, Mashi Shatinu Yele Refu'ah, Umashi Otarnu Yele Vracha. That what we ate should satisfy us, what we've drank should be a Refu'ah, should be a healing for us and what we've left behind should be for a blessing we always leave behind a little bit at the end of the meal so that when we say Birkat Amazon the Beracha should should uh, come about on that which is still there you don't want to clean up your table completely you want to leave over a little bit so that this blessing should come on this table this is part of the blessing and this is part of the life of a tzaddik that he does not emphasize certain things not the material, not the physical, and definitely not food. As we explained early on, what is, what's food all about? After a while, you've had it, you're, you've had enough of it. And when you're old, you can't have it even if you wanted it, even if you liked it. You just don't have an appetite. When you're sick, you don't even want to see it. What does all that show? That it's unimportant. It's really unimportant, but people still go after it. Only those, of course, do not discipline themselves, do not control themselves. A real tzaddik, starts off disciplining himself, starts off controlling himself, and when one controls himself with food, he will be able to control himself in other areas of life too. It has to start somewhere, and that's a good place to start. So go on a diet as of tomorrow. And Bezat Hashem, this will help you with your spiritual diet too, Bezat Hashem.